Hey all, welcome to another King's Crusher Tuesday night radio show. So we're starting a few minutes early actually, usually it's ten past nine. Uh, so we're going to carry on looking at amazingly famous notable games. The period here, 1910 to 1919. So yeah, I'm going to carry on looking at like uh, yeah notable games from here. This first one's a bit of a I don't want to I want to actually destroy any tension for the game, but it was uh, the battle of two of the leading hypermodernists at the time, Retty playing white against Savely Tartakower. Uh, so they're both known as like hypermodernists. Uh, you know they had great new ideas after the Second World War. Am I saying that right? Sorry, um, not Second World War. <laughs> After the war, uh, no. Th this game is played in 1910. Uh, yeah, World War Two, of course, 1939 to 45. Though, for some reason, I had that in mind. The hypermodernists after a World War. No, it was after. Okay, the First World War. Uh, anyway, I should, probably shouldn't have got into that area. Okay, but anyway, Richard Retty uh, against Tartakoa. Uh, so it starts off with e4 and uh, from Richard Retty. So he's known for, as a hypermodernist, he invented like the Retty system. Uh, that's what he was famous for because he, he um, had some very, very good results of it. I think beating Kevin Blank with Knight, Knight F3. But anyway, that's later perhaps. E, e4. Now Tarsko plays the Korokan C6. We have d4, d5. And uh, it looks pretty standard so far. Knight c3. It all looks pretty standard. Uh, let's add, actually add. I'm not sure there'll be a need to, but I'm going to add a convertor anyway. Okay, d takes e4. Knight takes. And quite often, the main move here is bishop f5. So, for example, bishop f5 is the main move. And you'd have games typically they run like this. A lot of games from that position. That's that's the typical move, but there, there are some rarer um, alternatives. So knight f6 is a reasonable one, offering double pawns. But they're both kind of dynamic. If white takes either, either this or this, is both like di dynamic uh, stuff going on. But actually, white played a tricky move. There's only four move, uh, games in in live book with this tricky looking move, queen d3. You might want the Queen d3, Queen d3, and Black tried to react um, energetically here, uh, trying to maybe embarrass uh, this move in some way, trying to maybe refute it. Maybe, maybe that's that's something interesting about this. So it's, you're faced with a very unusual move, not in book. You know, maybe it's good for a surprise move, Queen d3. Perhaps you know black can simply um, well actually you know if black takes uh, this this is um, this is okay for for white in this position I believe uh, this this is tricky uh, in fact here, this might be good yeah creating some weaknesses and then just dropping back job done slightly better for white so that that's actually a tricky move queen d three. Uh, but here, e5, very energetic idea now is revealed, uh, which is uh, after taking, right? Not not to take here because that's like that would be just uh, you know pawn down for a moment. That that's no good. That wasn't Black's idea. His idea was this this check. Now White reacts uh, with Bishop d2, and Black just takes this. But now, uh, so it looks as though this is a nasty pin, right? How do you actually parry this pin? This is what maybe Tartakoa was banking on. Like this, this pin just seems nasty. Uh, so you know, F, a move like f3, you know, Black's probably going to be better. You know, after taking, you can isolate a pawn. Job done. Isolate a pawn, and, and Black's better. You can set up a nice blockade on this pawn. But the thing is here, <clears throat> White played a tricky move here, 
So white to play, I wonder if you can guess and continuation. White to play here, what would you play in this position? So I, I kind of helped you along the way in fact because f3 if it's not f3 then what is it yeah there's not too many actually there's not too many other moves if it's not f3 there's not there's not actually a great deal of other moves right here so okay let's carry on castling yes uh, it probably wasn't the most difficult uh, quiz there now black uh, fought well what, what is this kind of just like win a piece clearly you're probably thinking I can't win a piece like this because uh, there's rookie one right yeah so but why can't I win a piece like this end of game thanks very much so it's it just seems that this is okay this is a classic game so yeah yeah okay uh, white to play here okay uh, I wonder if you can spot it <laughs> uh, that there's a move here which actually um, is, is pretty shocking and shows the brutality of pretty forcing moves uh, yeah uh, shows the brutality I uh, have you seen this this game before you might have seen this game so like 200 points if you've seen this game before or you are guessing it now someone said bishop g5 no not not bishop g5 uh, but you're on the right track here that if, if you did you know you you would be threatening a mate there but you know black can just take here and it's check so not not bishop g5 Uh, okay. Um, okay. So not bishop g5. Okay. There's a very very forcing of queen d8 check. Yeah, queen d8 check. So there's not too many options. There's, a, there's only one move option, but here it's this. We often uh, distinguish types of check, um, and maybe don't appreciate the power of the double check. I, I believe one of the big powers of a double check is it makes an even more forcing check, more clinical type of check, because there's even less options for the opponent because they've got to handle two checks at once, and usually the only defense to two checks at once is moving the king so here can you spot the killer double check uh, I might give it away uh, ki killer um, killer move what's the killer what's the killer move here <clears throat> which appears you know it shouldn't really be maybe in, in some respect uh, that it shouldn't be allowed to be this naughty chess positions shouldn't be this naughty um, now, if you, there's okay, I can either give you a thousand points or minus one thousand points, right? Now, if you said bishop a5 check, like that's like minus one thousand points, yeah, because e either of these two king moves, and then, then what, yeah, you're just trying to guess the first move, you see, you shouldn't be guessing the first move, you should ho look at the whole continuation, yeah, because what, what happens here, nothing, uh, you know, bishop d8 check and king e8. Uh, no, no, the right check is is this one. It's a sweet double check, really sweet double check, because now, funny enough, it looks as though the king's heading over here. But oh, bishop d8 is checkmate. It stops the king heading over there. Yeah, it's a brutal game. It's in a lot of people's um, game collections, and it made it to the most one of the most notable games. And that's probably one of the shorter ones I'm going to show you actually. <laughs> ever from this series so that's one of the short ones uh, at chess games come a lot of kibitzing on it it's it's kind of um, it was discussed by Edward winter yeah it, it got some fame this game I think the reason you'll find it it's famous you know they're both very very famous players actually so Tartico was known for loads of quotations witty quotations and they're both hypermodernists 
and I think I think quite col they must be quite colourful in character. I mod this because they were trying to they created a lot of new ideas, creative ideas, and had to communicate them. So I think kind of the more colourful players I, I expect as chess players go. So anyway, so this game became very notable in 1910 in Vienna. Okay, let's have a look at uh, I assume a longer game now. <laughs> it's I I've, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a, a longer game, right? Um, Otherwise, this is going to be quick. Okay, so this next game is Ossip Bernstein against Capablanca. Let's take Black side, Capablanca side. So this is played in Moscow, nineteen fourteen. So uh, D four, D five. We have a classical. So Capablanca wasn't playing in a very uh, exciting way. It seems here. But it does the job of peace development and getting castled, and he sorts out this bishop. Funny enough, this b6, uh, I I think sometimes it is called the Tartico variation, not here apparently. Uh, it's just Queen's Gambit declined classical. Uh, I thought it might have been Tartico. Orthodox defense, main line. Anyway, c takes. E takes, and we have Queen A4. So White is trying to use the weakened uh, light squares to swap off the light square bishop, which he does so. Capablanca takes, and doesn't mind hanging pawns. So hanging pawns are when like they're adjacent to each other. Sometimes hanging pawns are a big liability. So White takes here, trying to maybe weaken d5 potentially, gives Capablanca the dreaded hanging pawns. But there's certain compensation here. This b file, for example, for example, the piece plays quite good. Of course, this dark square bishop could be dangerous later. Now the objective, if you're playing against the hanging pawns, is usually to try and fix them down. Uh, to try and force one of them forwards, fix them down, and use the holes. White castled here, and we have Queen B6. And now taking here would help Black a little bit, but might might be possible. But it helps Black a little bit. That pawn structure is more solid there, and um, Black's very close to being equal. So we have uh, Queen E2. But now Black voluntarily pushes one of the pawns, and it creates bind effects on that poor B pawn. And in fact, structurally. You could argue that this backward this is like a backward pawn almost. It's it's a pawn which is um is a problem for white here on that semi open B file. Uh we have rook F D one. That's protected. Knight D four. And now Bishop B four is interesting because it kind of implies that black's got a nice control of E four here. Uh might be interested at some point in taking we have b3, rook ac8, and now white takes rook c2, and he's maybe looking forward to trying to uh, use the fact this pawn might be weak. Black took and knight d5. Now, is this pawn weak or strong? Now, in this position, uh, rook takes c4 is not possible because there's a very very good tactic here can you see this didn't happen black play has a very very good tactic in this position do, do you know this didn't happen in the game so in the game uh you know after after 95 the rook actually retreated but can you see what black can play here Any ideas? Yeah. Okay, I hope you can spot the tactic knight c3. It just about works. Well, it works. Because, you know, this move is, is check. It's worse than just taking the queen. Um, well, just knight c3 just wins material, right? So um, we have here uh, rook c2. 
And now c3, so this, this pawn is now protected by the knight as well as the rook. So the hanging pawns have have transpired that the hanging pawns are now this the remnant of it is that pawn there. White tries to hit it hard now with more pressure. Rook c5, knight b3. And here White should just maybe repeat as he has been doing. And it's difficult to see actually how black might be able to improve the position here if white had repeated um white doesn't have to uh yeah if white repeats here for example uh knight b4 i think it is safe enough just to take here there's no back row issue so he didn't do that funny enough he played knight b5 and now after this he took with knight takes c3 and black now took uh, took and there's a move which white missed here which wins so you might have seen this game it's a pretty classic game so black to play and win uh, so I wonder if you can get it for 200 points um, sometimes in chess uh, that there, there could be you you identify some downsides of the opponent's position maybe one downside there could be a loose piece somewhere and you might discover another one and sometimes you just the discovery of more than one downside is very helpful because then you can get your opponent almost juggling simultaneously having to handle both downsides or more at once now because in chess we can only move one move at a time that makes like the tactics often have that at the heart of tactics is this juggling business forcing the opponent to juggle multiple like downsides of a position so here there is there is clearly a back row theoretical issue right and there's also a loose piece like theoretical issue but and you often get this in a lot of games you know when you discover one weakness and you get excited you might not try and discover another and if you don't actually I, i've really wanted to do this theoretical lecture for ages by the way if you don't discover another downside it could be a blitz game or you, you play a suboptimal move you'll find that the opponent has resources available just to cover that one aspect you might have uh, found a weakness you know and and you're frustrated because you've only focused on one weakness right and you focus on the resources for one weakness and you get really annoyed yeah because like queen b1 check unfortunately the opponent has a resource and you're really annoyed with their one move they're able to handle that right with queen f1 the thing is black's also got a downside here so can't afford this because of rook c8 check and, and black gets mated so that's why a lot of uh, success, the successful tactics requires you to find more than one downside of the opponent's position to, to make everything work you know more beautifully well the opponent with their single move cannot handle more than one weakness so these more clinical moves so you get excited at the first weakness but and this, ha this happened to me actually just in some critical games and you get excited and the opponent's just defending like crazy that one angle of the position but when you get two angles of a position together that you know and you combine them it's it's actually sometimes a magnificent aesthetic effect as well so well done if you find this or seen this before queen b2 it's combining the back row weakness with the loose piece right on c3 and with the one move white is unable to defend both and believe it or not it's it's a very very simple principle that a lot of tactics they do rely on the principle of a double attack in some form but another, to me, another expression of, you know, the double attack is, is getting the opponent juggling, you know, these weaknesses you've identified. 
So I, I wanted to talk about that for some time, by the way. But now here, it's impossible for the opponents to juggle both, right? Because Queen E1, there's a crushing forcing move here. Yeah, Queen E1 would seem to juggle both, right? The back row and the loose piece, but actually it doesn't, because Black has a Black's win here. What what is what is what is Black playing here? So you can see the juggling falls over. White's dropping one of the weaknesses. Yeah. Queen B1. I'll just look at that in a moment. Can you see what Black plays here? So Black's play here. I mean, this 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 is why you know um, it's almost as if tactics in chess uh, are basically playing on the fact the opponent only has one move available. So the most crafty, deadly tactics are combining multiple liabilities together to force the opponent to juggle them with the single move. Uh, I have definitely read this. I don't know if it's a breach of copyright, but it was. And I'll quote it. It was in one of Yasser Soen's introductions to tactics fundamental of all tactics right but anyway so here queen takes c3 and the queen is overloaded yeah because if it takes then rook d1 is mating and there's no controversy with with blacks back row now someone's mentioned um sorry what did someone mention there's no queen b1 what is this queen b1 business So that's it. If 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 rook here, we just take the queen, right? No, we just take the rook. In fact, uh, that's well, that's clearly over. Yeah, there's just no defense to queen b2. If rook c2, let's try rook c2. Then still the back row check. And in fact, again, this is a beautiful illustration because we picked on two, right? We don't have to rely on just the back row here. We don't have to get mated with rook d1 here. We just take the rook in this case. See? So that's the fundamental of, of chess tactics right here in this very, very simple example that sometimes it takes two liabilities coming together and you get the opponent juggling and they can't handle both with a single move. And it's a very, very pretty well-known uh, game, this one. Uh, but yeah, I definitely, I had this um, game at the end of the ICC, oh, I've got my alerts up, pardon me, let me close my alerts. <laughs> I, I had this game at the end of the ICC Open that I, I really wanted to show on, on my channel, which which has the idea of a double attack overload. But I mean, I think it's it's a principle we just, we might, some of us might just take for granted. I don't think I'll be able to find that game now, actually. So let's look at this third game, right? Oh, you want to have a look at another try? Rook d3. Now, yeah, rook d3. Yeah, so it, f it creates a trap at least, so if it takes, that loses. But we have either queen a1 or queen b1. Because in this case, in this case, what we can do is play the check here and then take the rook. Yeah. Or the same with queen b1. We just take care. So yeah, it's a it's a lovely example of combining two weaknesses. Okay, all right. Let's have a look at another game then. Okay, Laska against Capablanca. This is St. Petersburg, nineteen fourteen. So Laska against Capablanca, e four. Let's have a look from the white perspective e5 and this was the last round game and people thought you know Lasker is getting on a bit wouldn't be able to handle the young Capablanca and he did something very weird he like simplified because it was thought to be weird because Capablanca was thought to be really strong in the endings so White played this line which essentially simplified and gave Black the bishop out of course he doubled the pawns yeah uh, so this looks harmless yeah this continuation until now there's a hint hang on maybe, maybe there's a point to this uh, this move because it does seem to be gaining space but surely black's okay right but here after f6 
f5. And this square has been marked out, this e6 square. And now white gets rid of black's bishop pair. Um, perhaps black's best would have been uh, to take and play, sorry, to take and play c5. Uh, black should be okay here in theory. Uh, I think the prospect is to play like bishop b7 and this pawn might be a target. It, it could be a, a big target later. But maybe Capablanca was attracted to the idea of his pawn structure being fixed. And here, here lies a bit of controversy actually because just just from a logical perspective when we're in the world of chess everything's not quite as logical as it sounds because why would you want to like take here lose your bishop pair to play c5 and bishop e7 it's all it's all in the concrete analysis i think it turns out that this is actually quite a downside of white's position e4 um and in fact, with this move, white's fine now because actually he's given, it seems technically white's fine because white takes, and although it undoubles the pawns, there, there is a target on the default, plus this knight can come to e6 now. So this whole thing about e4, if you've got a gigantic knight on e6, then e4 isn't such a target. Uh, so we're going to have a gigantic knight now coming to e6 with tempo. So, yeah, this is a position which, in fact, White has less to worry about. Uh, just he's he's basically it's almost like paradoxical. He he's undoubled Black's pawns, but in doing so, you know, he's created the target on d6 and he's got this massive knight on e6. So if I asked you, was it worth, you know, what was it worth undoubling the pawns? What what would you say so far? You've you've kind of helped the opponent, or have you, or have you given them new liabilities? Was it worth undoubling the pawns? I might have already biased you. Uh, what what would you say? Just yes or no? Evaluation. What do you reckon? Was it worth undoubling? You, you could say the knight looks impressive on e6. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. Well, that's something to think about anyway. So rook a d1. And yeah, there's this target and this is gigantic knight. And, and Capablanca's now passive. He's actually got this horrible, the, guy, the person with the backward pawn is Capablanca. Because really this one, it isn't such a liability, even though it's theoretically backward, this pawn means it's not really an exploitable backward pawn whilst this one is an exploitable backward pawn so that's an interesting question about what is a weakness in chess it's a weakness is only a weakness if it's like exploitable what do we mean by that it's the whole context of the position so here white is free to like you know double on on d6 uh, if he wants then he starts fixing, you know, against c5. He's fixing down, snuffing out counterplay. And he's like laughing here, saying, well, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Uh, you know, that's that's not a move. This is not a position maybe Capablanca. He should really consider sacking the exchange. He tolerated that knight. That knight might be worth sacking the exchange for to try and breathe some life into the position. But even that, it's, it's not very nice for black to sack. The exchange so he accepted that horrible knight but now there's a horrible plan that emerges here in this position and it involves a key pawn break now I wonder if you can identify identify the key pawn break plan can you what pawn break do you think is critical here? 
that White has available. It's not an entirely locked down position. Black might be interested, by the way, if Black has a few moves, he's clearly put in a bid for A5 as a pawn break. Now, what is White's um, kind of pawn break here, do you think, in this position? With the gigantic knight on e6 is the clue. Uh, so pawn breaks are often more effective when they celebrate existing fantastic pieces, like the knight on e6 is on g7. How can we celebrate this fact of this gigantic knight on e6? I wonder. Uh, someone's mentioned e5 and I'm not sure e5 does anything actually uh, or, no actually you've got a point if taking then it is bad this is bad if to actually not because of rook d7 although that's good but actually rook d8 is quite good here with the threat of rook takes and rook d8 check and I'm not sure what black does actually what does black do this is massive this position Threatening rook takes and then knight d6 check. Hmm. Yes, tasty. Uh, if this 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 is like losing for black. But the thing is, okay, e5 is very tempting. So give yourself some points. Uh, the thing is with e5, uh, f takes, and it's not entirely clear now uh, that this is crushing. You know, knight e4, d5. With check, king f6. Black should be okay here. No, that isn't that isn't the pawn break. Although it's immediate, uh, sometimes the immediate ones uh, are not so effective as the more delayed. You no, know, it's a, in fact this idea of g4, g5 to open the g file, which would celebrate the knight's g7. Because if we have a rook cooperating with the knight, this is going to be vicious. So g4, this is the pawn break to open up things. H6. And in fact, already the rooks are are celebrating in anticipation with rook d3, basically saying, okay, this might happen. And I might get either the g file or the h file, either. So a5, h4. Yep, our rook is going to land to help the knight soon. Takes, takes. Uh, now, not too many entry points with that. You might think rook a3, this isn't played. Well, white just ignores that with g5. It isn't played. We have rook a e7. So Capablanca totally tied down. And plays that, white plays king f3. Probably black's best practical thing is to take here. He didn't. Now white just improves the position again. And sort of teasing black about this g5. Now black, if black tries to stop g5 with g5 check here, then simply what would simply probably this is really strong. Because what would happen here is the pawns have fragmented, job done. So this is a major target, sitting target there. That that would be terrible, this position because we've got a sitting target there. We can't get rid of actually. Uh, it's just going to be lost. So g5 is not palatable actually because of just uh, not not this because that loses the knight, but but just bringing the king back. So we have actually though g6 played, and in fact we get a similar position anyway. Rook g3 threatens now g5, and Capablanca did end up playing g5 check. So we've got this horrible peeling operation down the h file now. Knight b6, hg, rook h3 dominating you know the h file, the one open file, which is very painful with the knight on e6. King g3, the rooks are going to go in, uh, but in fact, there's another crushing pawn break here. Which has been mentioned before, but now it's optimal in this position. Can you? Well, oh, I think I might have given away what sort of move it is. So white, white play here. Sorry. <laughs> oh dear. Okay. What would you play here then? Which would, would there's some interesting alternatives. Um, 
Mm, mm, mm. Te technically, actually, there's another move which is super strong in this position. Yeah. Well, they're both really strong. Now, I, I don't think I'm going to ask. I'm, I'm going to show you. E5 gives this fantastic E4 square. Yeah. For the knight, but also strong in this position. It's so strong. Rook H6. We can delay this and then play E5 here. Either, you know, if taking here, knight E4, threatens, knight takes D6. And, you know, it's going to be like a family fork if Black's not careful. But uh, in fact, you know, so rook h6 is probably even stronger, but e5 is super strong. Takes knight e4. So threatening knight takes f6. Knight d5 trying to defend. But the knight swings over here. Well, this one swings over there. There's various moves which are really strong here. Bishop c8 offering the exchange because. Uh, if here then knight takes and then knight d6 check quite a comedy of folks going on here uh, if here well same thing takes the knight d6 so black in the light of this horrible forcing move stuff uh, gave up the exchange here uh, knight takes and now the rooks come in rook h7 with the threat, well, there's another beautiful threat actually, sadistic. Uh, rook a1 for this rook to come over the queen side, which black had opened up that a file, funny enough, earlier. Uh, so this happens, this is horrible. The rooks are, this is a humiliation game for poor Capablanca, who was the rising star, playing someone who was maybe thought people thought were past it, and he's getting, he's just got positionally massacred in this game completely tied down the threat now after knight c5 is is rook d7 check and it, you know that's that's horrible also even knight e6 uh is is another threat uh for taking the bishop so black uh, after knight c5 black capablanca resigned so Lasker remains a bit of a mystery because people didn't find him that instructive, but he had fantastic results and great longevity, long, longevity, sorry, longevity, as a world chess champion. But people found his style pretty mysterious. But it seems you know sometimes, strangely, people say about avoiding the opponent's strengths and playing on their weaknesses. The choice of opening here is almost a paradox to that. He almost as if he played the opening to head for an end game. Maybe thinking sometimes people with certain strengths might overestimate their positions. Black clearly overestimated, but the key the key juncture of black going downhill was probably uh when black didn't play bishop takes f4. Maybe he didn't reckon on white fixing his pawn structure. There might have been an overestimation there. But it's a magnificent game by Lasker because he really gave black no counterplay as well. And so it does show this kind of paradox about what is a weakness in chess. Is a weakness something it has to be exploitable? So fixing the opponent's double pawns to make undissolved, you know, to repair them. But if you get other targets which are exploitable, then fine. That might be the lesson, one of the many, one of the many lessons of this game. But there's also this psychological basis for it about going into the opponent's strengths sometimes if you think they can overestimate. That might be a, an area of them losing, uh, which sounds weird, but maybe it's, it's true um, to some extent. But Lasker was brilliant, like tactically and positionally, to be able to do this. Um, and master psych psychologist as well so okay i hope you enjoyed the games uh, this week okay so thanks uh, if you like the video please like it and uh, have a good week uh, i think that's it this week thanks see you next week thanks very much